Uh, so welcome to this monthly series of shockwave seminars that was originated by Tracy uh, Vogler. Uh, we appreciate him very much. Oh, he looks like he's here now. Um, today I'll be the host and we're fortunate today to have two early career researchers give uh, short presentations on their current work. Um, the meeting is nominally scheduled for an hour and we have two uh, talks. So I'd like to try to keep uh, the presentations down to 20 minutes, max 25. At 25, I'll be raising alarms. Um, if you have questions, please wait till the end of the talk, uh, of the half talk and feel free, however, to enter questions at any time in the chat box. And um, our first uh, talk will be by, oh, let's see, and the two, the two speakers will be Dr. Belinda Pacheco uh, from Los Alamos and Dr. Sylvia Pandolfi from Stanford University, uh, uh, Slack. And uh, let me start with Belinda. Um, Belinda uh, was uh, as, an, as a Texas native who uh, grew up in Muleshoe, Texas. And she received her bachelor's degree from Texas Tech University and attended graduate school at the University of Illinois, which was my great fortune because she came to work for me and spent about five years in my lab earning her PhD before um, uh, moving to Los Alamos where she has an Agnew Fellowship. Those of you who are old will immediately think this is the Spiro T. Agnew Fellowship. Uh, Nixon's uh, disgraced vice president, but really it's the Harold Agnew Great Shock Researcher Fellowship. And uh, Belinda is uh, going to talk about, let's see, the title of her talk is um, Observing and Modeling Hotspots in Individual Explosive Crystals with Shock Compression Microscopy. And I will just for one moment take advantage of my position of knowing her very well to tell you kind of an amazing fact about Belinda, which is She's been married for several years and her husband is a professional opera singer who tours the country singing opera. So Belinda, if you can share your screen, I hope. Uh, you're I tried familiar. to turn on my video for my camera, but it wasn't letting me. Either way, it's not a big deal. Oh, we'll miss seeing you, but we'll certainly see your talk. So please go ahead. All righty. Well, thanks, Dana, for the introduction. Also, thanks to the committee for the invitation to speak to you all today. Thanks for sticking around. And so today I'll be highlighting some of the research that I conducted towards the end of my time in Dana's group, um, where I was mainly using experiments with the shock compression, compression microscope to study hotspots in a model PBX. And so before I get started, I want to acknowledge my collaborators in Dana's group. Uh, Dr. Xuan Zhao and Hoya, who helped me with sample prep and characterization. And also, I want to acknowledge Professor Uday Kumar's group at the University of Iowa. They conducted all of the computational work you'll be seeing today. And so to get started, I want to motivate my talk and discuss the grand challenge in the field of uh, high explosives today. And so that grand challenge is that we have not yet arrived at predictive microstructurally informed reactive simulations. And one of the main contributing factors as to why we're not there yet is that we do not yet have the models that can adequately predict um, re explosive behavior because these models are based on large scale experiments. So they're really good at capturing large scale phenomena, albeit not yet predictive, but they don't do as good of a job as look at looking at small scale phenomena, places where microstructure really come into play. And so some uh, two subcategories of challenges feeding into this grand challenge are computational challenges, which I won't discuss today, and also there are significant experimental limitations. And really when it comes to experiments, we want our experiments to do it all. We want them to have high time and space resolution while also spanning multiple time and length scales. And the fact is we don't have experiments that can do it all. But during my graduate research, I 
aimed to look at this model plastic bonded explosive to see if I could inform those time and length scales where we really lack information. And so this model plastic bonded explosive consisted of an individual explosive crystal embedded in a polymer, and we would use laser driven impactors to initiate reaction in this model system. And so some of our main aims were to understand how is energy concentrated in this model system, where do so-called hot spots form or these discrete reaction sites, and also why do they form there, what temperatures do they reach, and ultimately can we reach reaction rate like parameters to inform and help our computational colleagues address this grand challenge problem. And so in the next few slides, I'll explain how we conducted these experiments. So the overall experimental concept is that we use this shock compression microscope, which you'll see in the next slide. And that shock compression microscope implements laser driven impactors to shock tiny arrays of high exposure explosive samples. And so I'll walk us through the main components of that system. And so here we have a cross-sectional schematic of the sample manifold of the microscope. So here we have a flat top laser pulse, which we shape and manipulate to have this flat top. When that pulse arrives at this aluminum foil, which is epoxied onto this glass, glass substrate, it ejects this tiny planar impactor or a flyer plate. And so that flyer plate flies across this gap provided by this spacer, and that gap is also held under rough vacuum. And so here the samples consisted of an individual grain of HMX, a high explosive embedded in a polyurethane binder. And so in these experiments, we can collect the thermal emission, among other things, in PDV or photon Doppler velocimetry. And then we can divert that optical emission to our detectors. And here on the right, I have a few more specs and conditions excuse me, conditions that our shock compression microscope can reach. And so now I'm going to take a step back and show you how this sample manifold fits into the rest of the microscope. And so here's a cartoon of the microscope. This little red square indicates where that cross-sectional view was that I just showed you. And so this commercial inverted microscope, which is also a tabletop microscope, is really the crux of what uh, the experiments that we conducted and the work going on in Dana's group. And so I also on this slide want to highlight the various detectors that I used in my graduate work. First, I used PDV or photon Doppler velocimetry. Not only does the PDV allow us to get the velocity of the flyer plates, but it was also important for this for these sets of experiments to determine the time at which the flyer impacts the surface of the polymer. And that is time zero, so I offset all of the data to that. And also we have this high speed gated four frame camera. This is a camera that essentially gives us four sna snapshots of emission during the shock event for every single experiment. And so this particular camera can have gate widths down to two nanoseconds, but I typically use a gate width of 20 just so I could collect more signal. And before I move on to the last detector, I do wanna show you some examples of the pictures you're about to see. And so here we have a background uh, picture, a static image taken with this uh, camera. And so what you're seeing here is an octagonal outline of a spatial filter that we use to block some light artifacts from the flyer plate. In the center, we see a high explosive crystal. And so this image was taken prior to shock with a microscope light on. Whenever we do the experiment, we, we turn off the light and collect only the emission coming from the sample. And we also false color that for viewing purposes. And occasionally we will also superimpose the two so we can see where the emission is coming from with respect to the original sample. And so to move on to the last detector, this is an optical pyrometer that has been described multiple times by the Delot group. We have a few papers on it, so I won't go into detail, but hopefully it will suffice to say that we can produce and calculate temperature transients with down to two nanosecond time resolution using gray body method techniques. And so with that, we are now ready to talk about results. And so I'm going to briefly highlight three studies today. 
And I like to start with this first study that we published early last year, where we were really aiming to establish this technique and these methods. And so for this study, we really wanted to create a baseline understanding for what this model system is doing. And so to do so, we wanted to compare single crystals of HMX versus defective crystals. So by defective here, I'm really just talking about crystals that had a high concentration of internal voids or cracks, or maybe they were twin or a combination of those. But what I'm showing you first here are the fast frame images from this particular single crystal of HMX that were shocked. And up, up above, we have the timestamps. And so the pervasive behavior for these single crystals from the images that we saw were that hot spots or these discrete reaction sites started along edges and corners. So here we see a particular edge. Hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, and we see that emission is coming from those edges and that bottom corner as well. So as time progresses, those hot spots grow and coalesce and they span the length of the crystal. And we also are able to compare that to the simultaneous pyrometry. And so here, what I'm showing you is a graph of the temperature in black versus the radiance, where the radiance you can think of as the intensity of the black body emission, just to be oversimplistic. And so we see for the radiance, there's really good agreement between um, the pictures and the radiance. And in terms of the temperature, as soon as we have enough signal to calculate the temperature, it starts off at around 4,000 K, then cools off to about 3,000 K. Um, towards the end of the observation period. And so this behavior was distinct as compared to the defective crystals, which had different behavior. And so here we have a polycrystal and actually this little inverted Y region that you see here was a large aggregation of internal voids. And so how this behavior was different is that very early on, we see emission coming from those internal voids and that emission as well was associated with much higher temperature so around 6,000, 5,000 K. And so at this point, we could really only hypothesize what was happening in this system. And we have hypothesized that the internal voids were collapsing and product gases were being compressed, leading to those higher temperatures. But what really helps inform this study is the next study, the one that we conducted in collaboration with Professor Uday Kumar's group in Iowa. And so in this study, we sought to compare reactive continuum simulations to experiments for this model PBX. And so I'm going to start off this section by explaining our methodology. So we would, I'm going to go ahead and put on my um, laser pointer. We would go ahead and make samples as normal. However, this time I would pass the samples off to our postdoc, Shuan, and she would conduct nanocomputed tomography stan uh, scans or nano CT. So we would generate hundreds of X-ray cross sections. We would send those cross sections I'm having trouble with the moving on. We would send those cross sections to Chauvin in Iowa, and he would upload those to his program using an active contouring subroutine. And so there were several, of course, cross sections to choose from, but we typically went with ones whose microstructure was most representative of the sample. And lastly, Chauvin would run the simulations to find a particle velocity of interest. He would relay that particle velocity to us, and then we would conduct the shock experiment. And so we were looking at particle velocities right above the threshold where we started to see reaction. And so that was around 2.3 kilometers a second. And then um, I won't go into detail about their computational methods, but I do have a few major aspects and novelties about their techniques highlighted here below. And I also want to explain some geometrical concerns. So here in the simulation, the shock would enter from the top and exit from the bottom. And so this is a different orientation as compared to the pictures that I showed you in the previous slides from the camera. So in that configuration, we're viewing from the bottom. So it's like the shock is starting from behind the screen of the computer and coming out towards you. So even though these geometries are a little different, as you'll see, we can still compare. And so here I'm showing some results. Um, on the left, we have uh, the cross section that we ended up going with, we also see it had a significant amount of internal voids. 
On the right, we have the simulated temperature maps that Shoban generated. And so in this first tile that was around six nanoseconds, we see, we see that the shock front, which is this line here, has traveled through the top of the crystal, there has already been the collapse of some, of some internal voids. And if you zoom in, you can see that temperatures are around 6,000 K max. And so in the next slide, we see that more internal voids continue to collapse. There are more hot spots. There's even the potential that some of those hot spots are interacting. And then in later times, we see large scale reaction coming from the sample, as well as some cooling off happen happening around 60 nanoseconds. And so comparing that to the images we got from the experiment, we were only able to compare with the first two frames of the camera. And so what I'm showing you here, this line, I'm trying to indicate where that cross section plane is coming from that the simulation is looking at. So in general, we see that there is very intense emission, again, coming from those internal voids. We also see a delamination site here that made a hot spot there. Here we have the raw emission that you can see the um, results in a little bit more detail. But then by 60 nanoseconds, we're not seeing a lot of emission on the camera. And so this really made sense to us because we know that the temperature floor for the camera and for the pyrometer are both around 2000 Kelvin. And then comparing to the results out here, we see that some of those temperatures, most of those temperatures are below 2000 Kelvin. So we couldn't really resolve those. And so this is mainly a qualitative comparison. And in the next slide, I'm going to attempt to do a quantitative comparison where we're going to look at the intensity of the radiance down this yellow line and compare it to the simulation. So what we're seeing here in black is the defect location as taken from the x-ray cross sections. In the center section, we have the simulated radiance from um, the temperature maps that we saw before. And then on the bottom, we have the experimental radiances. So both of these results were taken in about six nanoseconds. And so also these results are normalized. So we can't really compare the intensities. And so now what I'm showing you here are the two main voids that have already been crossed by the shock front at six nanoseconds. And so we see fairly good agreement between the simulation and the experiment, albeit at different intensities. Also, we know that there is a lot more going on with the experiment. And that is likely because we have a known amount of jitter and error in our experiment when it comes to timing. So actually the shock front could have been deeper in the sample and interacted with more features, which may be why we're seeing more here. And so we can also compare the temperatures between both the simulation and the experiment. And so we see um, in the red is the, the simulated temperatures. In the black, we have various methods for experimentally averaging the temperatures. And we see, so in that growth phase for the hotspots, there's really good agreement between the temperatures. And also what you're not seeing here, but is visible in other samples that I'm not showing you today, is that there's also a good plateauing of the temperature of the experimental temperatures to 2000 Kelvin, which agrees with the simulation as well. But perhaps the results that I'm really more excited about are the ones where we're probing the hotspot formation mechanisms in a little bit more detail. So what you're seeing up above on the top row are those temperature maps that I showed you before. On the second row, you are seeing Schlieren-like images where the shock, where the Schlieren-like images indicate changes in density gradient. So they're really good at representing, at representing shock fronts and um, shock reflections. And actually in this first frame, we see small blast waves coming from those internal voids. And in the second frame, we see that there are more of those blast waves from those collapsed voids and the potential for them to be interacting with each other. And in the later frames, we start to see the deformation and fracture of the crystal. And so here, it was really interesting to think about how these blast waves could be interacting. And so we were also curious to 
with the crystal would react if there were no internal voids. So Chopin artificially removed those voids to see if there would still be reaction. And so in this crystal, for this particular geometry, we did still see surface reaction, which was really interesting because in some other samples at the same particle velocity, we did not. And so um, what's really interesting is that if you zoom in here, you can see some shock reflection and shock focusing leading to some shear banding. So that's really interesting to think about in terms of the single crystal experiments that I showed you earlier. And there's definitely more to say about all of this, but for the sake of time, I will move on to the very last uh, section that I wanted to discuss. And so this is a paper that we recently had accepted, and we're looking at how shock pressure dependence influences hot spot formation. And so this will be rather brief, but to start, I want to show you somewhat of an image gallery for this study. So in this study, we looked at six different uh, particle velocities or six different pressures. And for each pressure, we looked at 10 to 12 single crystals. And so here I'm showing you representative crystals at 1.8 kilometers a second, no sample displayed hot spot emission or yeah, hot spot emission at any time. And this changed at 2.1 nanoseconds where about 25% of the samples showed intermittent hotspots. And so as we increase the pressure, more and more samples started showing hot spots. And this changed once again as we crossed the second threshold. So around 2.8, we noticed that every single crystal was consistently forming hot spots that were also rapidly growing. So we determined at this point that every crystal was rapidly deflagrating. And so a major part of this study was discovering and finding these hotspot thresholds. But again, there are lots of interesting results in this study, so I do suggest that you go check them out, some of which are this analysis where we attempt to get at growth rates of these individual hot spots. And so here I'm showing you pixel intensities of a particular sample that had a really well behaved elliptical hot spot. So I made a program in MATLAB to fit these hot spots to an ellipse and it would extract the changes in radiance and air, sorry, radius and area. And with that, we could determine a type of expansion rate. And so for this particular sample, we saw an expansion rate of around 150 meters per second. If we look at another sample that was shocked at a higher particle velocity, that expansion rate was around 550 meters per second. And so why this is interesting is that there aren't a lot of data like these out there. There are some data in literature when it comes to deflagration rates, but that's really um, in bulk, large scale material. And so we're arriving at parameters that we can start to give to our computational colleagues so they can start to make these new generation of, of models. And so before I end this section, I do want to highlight some other things in the study that I didn't get to talk about. And so these things are that the pyrometry also indicates these pressure thresholds. Interestingly enough, at least within our limits of detection, the hot spot temperatures did not significantly increase with pressure. Also, we looked at what happens in these samples in long time, how does the polymer influence behavior, and also we did some really interesting postmortem analysis. And so with that, um, I'll just flash up my summary and I'll just go on to my acknowledgments. And I'd like to thank you all for your time and for sticking around and I'll take any questions if there's time. Thank you very much, Belinda. There is a question in the chat room. Uh, if anybody has a question they'd like to ask in the next couple of minutes, feel free to speak up. Okay, so I'm reading the question. Could you please explain the origin of the emission that you see outside of the crystal, specifically those at long times after time zero? Um, was there a particular slide that you were referring to for that question? If you could put that in the question and answers, that would be helpful. Um, but at least when it comes to later in time, I wonder if I have, let me share my screen again. I should have not stopped it. Um, 
let's see if I have any later time images. I don't think I do. Um, well, at least when it comes to later in time, we see that there is a significant contribution of the polymer to the emission, but that is post 500 nanoseconds. And I'm not actually showing any of those results here today. So it's really interesting. Um, I mentioned that those post-mortem analysis, we see that once we cross that threshold of 2.8, 2.5 kilometers a second, there is a lot of debris um, specifically from the decomposition of the polymer. And so um, we do believe that there is um, significant polymer effects happening later on, especially outside of that viewing area. Um, the first set of images you showed. Oh, it must have been these. Oh, yes, I didn't mention that. So this emission around here is that flyer artifact that I was referring to that we tried to block. And this particular experiment, things weren't aligned super well, so we did get some of that flyer artifact. And so that's what that spatial filter is for. And we have another question. Can you comment on why the radiance um, and temperatures don't show the same time trends. Does that mean that emissivity is time dependent or, and or it's highly, an, a highly non-equilibrium system? The same temperatures don't show the same time trends. Oh yes, so definitely when it comes to how the system is behaving, it's more representative to look at the radiance as compared to the temperature because the radiance is the composite of the temperature and the emissivity. And so definitely the emissivity is changing with time and that is why the temperatures don't show the same trends as the radiance. Um, hopefully that answers that question. Okay, well, thank you very much, Belinda. You can type into the chat room and answer the questions in text. Sure, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for your nice talk. Um, Sylvia, if you want to share your screen, I do have one little a brief announcement to make. Um, so this seminar series was started after the a pandemic caused us to cancel the APS meeting, which was our great meeting place. And, We've been doing pretty well, but we uh, would like to continue at least for a while. And so we would like some suggestions for speakers. And in particular,